Hello. Welcome to section four of chapter 34 on the American pageant. Uh, we're looking at Roosevelt and the shadow of war. Uh, World War II is raging in Europe. The Nazis, as of 1940, have controlled most of Europe. You have the Battle of Britain raging. And while this is going on, you have thousands and thousands of refugees coming out of Europe uh, that are Jewish in descent. Uh, one example of the many pogroms that happened before the war, and before the, quote, final solution to the Jewish problem, as the Nazis would put it, which was not until 1941, uh, is Kristallnacht. On November 9, 1938, mobs of Germans spontaneously, maybe ordered or urged along by the, uh, the Nazis, uh, attacked any business or home of the German Jews uh, in the night Kristallnacht, in the, the night of the broken glass, which they actually made them pay for uh, the cleanup, made them clean up all the mess themselves. Uh, just one of the terrible, terrible examples of what was going on in Europe. So following these attacks, thousands of Jews were being sent to concentration camps, not full-fledged death camps yet, uh, but being rounded up into ghettos, uh, sent to concentration camps, which are slave labor. They're not the Hilton by any means. They're terrible, terrible places. They're malnourished. They're being abused. Um, and so in response to this, FER creates the War Refugee Board to deal with the victims of the Nazis and other Axis powers. Um... And, and it's kind of a step in the right direction, but the United States arguably doesn't do enough to help the, the, the Jewish population during the war. Uh, by the war's end, it's, we'll come back to this in the next chapter in great, great extent. I'm not going to gloss over this. Uh, over 6 million Jews have been murdered in the Holocaust. Um, there's one stark example in the United States' history that kind of leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Is the, uh, the ship, the St. Louis in 1939, uh, was a ship with 930 German Jews going to Cuba. Uh, Cubans refused to allow them to, to stay, so they went up to each coast, just basically looking for a port, anywhere to dock, anywhere that would take them, allow them to be refugees, uh, to come to the country and try to get away from all the, the horror and destruction going on in, in Europe. So they wanted permission to dock. The State Department refused because the quota for Germans uh, was already filled for that year for immigration. They didn't have, they didn't distinguish between immigrants and refugees. Immigrants were coming here because they wanted a better life. Refugees were fleeing for their for their safety. Uh, so the ship actually went back to England. It went back to Holland, uh, where the Jewish population was disembarked. And eventually, uh, when they overran in 1940 in Holland, only 200 of the 930 survived uh, the war. And very sad in instance. And like I said, uh, the U.S. had no policy for immigration uh, for refugees at that time. Uh, the U.S. did benefit from one uh, Jewish immigrant from the German-speaking areas. Uh, Albert Einstein came here and eventually was a um, Princeton professor. Uh, and he famously authored the letter to Roosevelt to let him know about the atomic bomb being developed uh, by the Nazis, which wasn't actually authored by Einstein. We'll get to that. There's three other scientists who did it. The, the men from the moon or men from Mars, because they were so smart, they just knew Roosevelt would listen to it if, if his name was attached to it. So Britain, the Battle of Britain is raging. Uh, on August 1940, Germany bombed English cities to prepare for an invasion. In fact, initially they bombed military targets. Uh, they're bombing um, British uh, you know, factories, airfields, you name it, trying to bomb the Germans into submission. Uh, Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, convinced Hitler that they could possibly knock Britain out by a series of uh, coordinated strategic bombings, and they wouldn't have to invade Britain and, and fulfill Operation Sea Line, as it was called for the Nazis. Uh, they were hoping to break the British morale, and if Neville Chamberlain was still the Prime Minister, we should never have war again, that guy, and maybe they would have, but he resigned, he was sadly dying of cancer, and was replaced by Sir Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill defied Hitler, he inspired his people with his rousing speeches, about never surrender and offering his blood, soap, sweat, and tears. Um, he also liked to flash his V for victory sign, um, which, you know, basically they're losing 155 to nothing at halftime. He's like, two, we're going to win. V for victory. But oftentimes Churchill was a little lazy and he'd do it this way, which is pretty much inappropriate in the middle finger in Britain at the time. So the Brits loved that. Uh, the Luftwaffe never gained control over the skies. Uh, in 1940, a British bomber, um, not knowing where the target was, dropped their payload over Germany and hit civilians. Uh, it was an unintended accident, and so in retaliation, the Nazis shifted their targeting from military targets to civilians. Uh, and so London was bombed for 60-something straight days uh, in the Blitz. And because of that, the Royal Air Force actually had a chance to recover, and they inflicted heavy losses on the Nazis. 
They never gain control over the skies, and so eventually uh, Operation Sea Lion is called off. Um, the British Air Force also, the Royal Air Force also had a secret weapon, uh, carrots. No, I'm just kidding. But they had radar. Uh, and to keep the Nazis from knowing what was up, this new technology that let them know how many planes and how fast and what direction they were coming, they made this propaganda campaign that you know, eating carrots helped your eyes. Your mom probably told you that, and she was wrong. The British duped you as well. Carrots are good for you, but they don't help your eyes more than anything, uh, any other foods. Uh, here's some pictures. This is the Tower Bridge and the River Thames. Uh, the Tower of London, you know, damaged partially by the Blitz. These are Nazi air, uh, aircraft over London and the Thames River here in St. Paul's Cathedral was damaged as well. Uh, second biggest church in the world, actually. Should have known the Brits were going to win. You know, it's very simple. Scissors beats paper. Duh. Some pro-British propaganda here. We have Winston Churchill in a colorized vote uh, version of his photo. Uh, President Trump, one of his official White House portraits, is, has a scowl like that. He's trying to look like Churchill. Uh, this is a blacklist. This is from the Hoover Institute in Stanford University. Uh, very, very interesting. This is the book that the Nazis had for when they prepared to invade um, Britain. They were going to arrest all these people. And on page 32, you have Neville Chamberlain, former prime minister of the British right there. Uh, and then down here, number 49, the current prime minister, Winston Spencer Churchill. And so these are the people who would be rounded up and arrested and thrown in jail for being enemies to the Nazis. So... Back here in America, most Americans were neutral, but they sympathize with the Allies. They see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of similarities between us and the Brits and, and the French, what's left of them. Uh, and the Nazis are not very good people. Uh, there was a committee to defend America by aiding the Allies. They strongly supported helping the British. Uh, they still didn't want to actually fight, though. Like, we should send them, you know, letters and food and money and things like that. Uh, more vocal was the America First Committee, which tried to keep the U.S. out of European affairs. Two of the most prominent people that were part of the America First Committee were Henry Ford, who may or may not have been a Nazi. He was sympathetic towards the Nazi cause for much of the 30s. And Charles Lindbergh. Uh, Lindbergh, an aviation hero from flying over the, uh, the, the Atlantic in 1927, toured the Nazi Air Force or the Luftwaffe and was so impressed uh, and so scared by their technology and the advancement in, in aviation that he didn't think America would ever win. And so he campaigned against the war for the safety of America. To give both of them credit, once the war started, Ford's factories pumped out military hardware. Lindbergh, I believe, served in the war himself. Uh, <clears throat> on September 2nd, 1940, Roosevelt, increasing American involvement, transferred 50 destroyers left over from World War I to the British. Kind of like, hey, here's some, here's some old junk, you can use it. In return, they gave us eight viable defense base sites in the Western Hemisphere, including some in Greenland, uh, which helped out the United States as well. Here's a little in the fun list. Well-known corporations that helped the Nazis. This is usually pre-war. Uh, Ford and GM supplied most of the vehicles driven by the Nazis in the famous Blitz truck. Hugo Boss designed the Nazi uniforms. Volkswagen, uh, the first bug, was per partially designed by Ferdinand Porsche and Adolf Hitler himself. Uh, Puma. Uh, Adidas was founded by a guy named Adolf Dossler. And Adolf is shortened to Adi, Adi Dossler. Uh, his brother was a Nazi, and so he didn't want to, uh, he wanted to support the, the Nazi cause, and so he broke away and formed Puma. IBM sold a lot of the computation machines to keep track of all the people being rounded up in the camps. Uh, Chase Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation, funded a lot of eugenics research. Uh, Random House Publishing published Mein Kampf. Kodak supplied a lot of the film uh, for Nazi propaganda films and pictures. This is all pre-war, by the way. Uh, Coca-Cola, not Coca-Cola, I'm sorry about that. Um, they instituted Fanta. Uh, during the war, there was rationing going on. Sorry about this right here. And they wanted to have their soda, but Coca-Cola required too much sugar. So they did a lower sugar uh, soda called Fanta to help out. Alliance is a German company. Bear is a German company. Nestle is a French company taken over by the Germans. BMW, GE, Siemens, and Mercedes-Benz. In fact, BMW and Mercedes-Benz logos are still reminiscent of aviation. In fact, that's a propeller from Mercedes-Benz. BMW has a kind of a circle and a cross and has white and blue checkers, which symbolizes their propellers cutting through the blue sky when they flew over Europe. This is Henry Ford getting a medal from the Nazi government. Go Ford. <laughs> ah, the election, the two-term tradition. The election of 1940, Roosevelt, the Depression's not over, and war clouds are gathering. 
Uh, he decides to run for an th unprecedented third term. The Republicans nominate Wendell Wilkie. We almost had a president Wilkie. Oh, boy. Uh, they condemn Roosevelt's alleged dictatorship. They oppose the New Deal's in inefficiencies. Uh, Roosevelt decided that the stakes were too high, ran for a third term. He won the election. Um, basically, voters generally said that if war comes, they want experience in there. His electoral map. Uh, you can see a lot of the West and some of the Midwest states went to Wilkie, but most of the country still stuck with Roosevelt. Uh, these are women who are protesting the Lend-Lease Act in Massachusetts. We'll get to that here on our last slide for today, for this video. Uh, the monumental Lend-Lease Act of 1940. Once Roosevelt's re-election is secure, he steps up Americans' effort to help the British. Uh, basically, the United States is going to sell, lend, or lease arms and supplies to all of the Allies. $5.2 billion in munitions, $1.9 billion worth of shipping, repairs, production facilities, agriculture, industrial items. This marks any abandonment of any pretense of, of neutrality. The United States is involved. They are not belligerent uh, combatants in the war, but they are aiding the Allies. Hitler saw the Lend-Lease Act as an undeclared, unofficial declaration of war. Uh, and in fact, on May 21st, 1941, the Robert Moore, an unarmed American merchant ship, was destroyed by the Germans uh, outside the war zone in the South Atlantic, which will lead to a reaction by Roosevelt. This is a map showing where all the land lease went to, predominantly to Britain, but also to most of Asia, South Africa, all the British Empire. A big chunk of it went to the Soviet Union, which we'll get to in the next video, and Archangel. Lots of the Soviets here, lots of Australia and New Zealand, and also a lot to China. So that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, let me know. I hope you enjoyed this.